Hello everyone. I hope you're in a safe place and you're healthy and well. Thank you for joining us for the next talk in our Golden Webinars in Astrophysics series. My name is Thomas Puzia. I'm a faculty member at the Institute of Astrophysics of Pontificia Universidad Católica and the head of outreach. And together with Evelyn Johnston, one of our postdoctoral fellows, we will keep organizing this series of talks for you. Thank you very much for the overwhelming response to our Golden Week and the encouragement that we received. We really appreciate your comments and su suggestions, so please keep them coming. We will try to continue this series for as long as possible. We will also continue to bring you these talks in the original English and the Spanish simultaneous translation without any registration fees. This is being made possible by the generous support of the Center for Astrophysics and Related Technologies, also known as CATA for its Spanish acronym. Our talk this week will be given by Brent Tully, who is a professor at the University of Hawaii. But before we begin, we will first give you a brief introduction again into how this webinar will run. Uh, we have arranged a simultaneous language interpretation provided by Mr. Patricio Gonzalez, director of the Serendipia Soluciones, who will be simultaneously trans translating for, for us in both the English to Spanish and Spanish to English directions. On your devices, you can switch between the English and Spanish channels using the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Unfortunately, the live interpretation option is not offered for people using Zoom in the browser or on Linux machines. We apologize for this, but we will post both English and Spanish versions of, of the talk on our YouTube page in the next few days or the next week. Uh, we have also heard from a few participants that they could not mute the original soundtrack when listening to the Spanish translation. This appears to be a bug in Zoom. And we've been told that by leaving and rejoining the webinar should fix the issue. If you have any questions during the talk, please type them into the Q&A window. To open this window, just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, all viewers will be able to upvote questions and comment on them. And we have a team of astronomers and journalists behind the scenes who will be monitoring your questions and will select the best questions for discussion after the talk. The talk is expected to last around 45 minutes and we'll have time for discussion uh, for questions at the end. And the questions will only be selected from the Q&A window. So if you're watching on the YouTube stream, unfortunately, we can't take the questions from there. So before we begin, uh, we would like to briefly introduce, of course, the other panel members that are with us today. So Brent, of course, Patricio, Evelyn, and myself. Um, my colleagues from the Institute of Astrophysics, Alejandro Clocchiati, Ezekiel Trister, and Felipe Barrientos are with us. Also together with us are the postdocs, Paul Agintala, Giuseppe Diago, and Demetra De Chico, and the graduate students, Cristóbal Moya and Jonathan Quiroga. We have also um, the honor to welcome with us again today, John Blakesley, who is the chief scientist of Gemini Observatory, Brian Miller, who is an astronomer at Gemini Observatory, and Yara Yaffe, who is a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Valparaíso. We also have together with us uh, the Q&A managers who will be again sifting through the messages and questions for you in the background, Ricardo Acevedo, Daniela Fernandez, and Carlos Rojas. So let's begin. It is our great pleasure to introduce Professor Brent Tully as our speaker this week. Brent completed his Bachelor of Science at the University of British Columbia in 1964 and studied for, for his PhD thesis at the University of Maryland, which he finished in 1972. Following his PhD, he carried out a postdoc at the Observatoire de Marseille. In 1975, he began working as an astronomer thereafter at the Institute of Astronomy at the University of Hawaii. He also has served as a visiting scientist at a number of institutions, including the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile, the Observatoire Meudon in Paris, and the Instituto de Radioastronomia in Bologna and the Observatoire de Côte d'Azur in Nice. Brent is one of the pioneers of the, of the field of near-field cosmology, where the nearby universe is studied to look for clues to the formation and evolution of galaxies and even the universe itself. So two key aspects of his work that he's best known for are the Tully-Fisher relation, which outlines the relationship between the mass of galaxies and their luminosities that can be used to calculate the distance to galaxies, and also his nearby ca galaxy catalogues, the, uh, the most recent of which was released in 2013, and includes distances to over 8,000 galaxies. During his distinguished career, he has received many awards, including the Gruber Prize for Astronomy in 2014, 
in recognition of his role in understanding the structure and evolution of the nearby universe. And now we'd like to hand over to Brent to tell us about his work on galaxy flows and the formation of large scale structures. Oh, thanks for inviting me. I suppose I'm being seen right now. Okay, uh, see if we can uh, teach an old dog new tricks on how to give talks across the web. It's a delight to be here with you today, or be all around the world today. So I'm going to be talking then about galaxy flows and uh, the latest work that we've been doing, including something that's really very, very fresh at the end of my talk. So. Without further ado, I should uh, try and uh, attach my PowerPoint presentation here, which I should think I do by doing something like this, maybe. So with some good luck, you're now seeing my pr first page of the presentation. Is that correct? It's very good. Yes. 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 OK. So we're, uh, we're uh, going. So you see here at the bottom of uh, the page here, my collaborators, my most uh, important collaborators, I've actually got a lot of collaborators, but Hélène Courtois in Lyon and Yehuda Hoffman in Israel, in Jerusalem, and Danielle Panarad in uh, Paris. And we've been a little team then that's been working on this uh, with everything I'll be telling you about today. So let's see. I didn't uh, this transfer the next slide. Ah. So the universe started almost uniformly as a hot gas. And so if we were to go back 13 billion years plus, we would have seen in the universe, it would, we, it would have been an uninhabitable universe, of, uh, just like being in the center of the sun. Uh, but gravity pulled. Uh, structures together over the fullness of time and uh, as you'll see here that in this little movie here that uh, is being shown. Now this is a simulated show. One of the things that I'll be showing you repeatedly then is you do know that the universe is expanding uh, and it's expanding at a rate that's defined by this thing called the Hubble constant which is telling us telling us how fast the universe is expanding as a function of, uh, of distance from us. Now, all that's going to be taken out of the images that I show you. So everything will be in what is called co-moving coordinates. And so we're taking away that expansion, but we're going to be seeing what's happening uh, above and beyond or on a smaller scale than that expansion. And as you just saw for that little movie, uh, gravity in a simulation, then gravity has been working to pull matter together into knots where there, where galaxies are being formed. But as I say, this is a simulation, and what I really want to talk about is the real world and what we can show the real world. So here's a little movie here that uh, shows some work we've done. Now here's a these, each point on this map is a galaxy. Uh, within our local region, the plane of our Milky Way is causing some obscuration here. That uh, will repeatedly see the effects of that obscuration. But here's the verbal cluster, it's this blue thing over here, and each one of these is a galaxy. Well, this is just the, the uh, sky painted on a flat plane, but let's see what it looks like in three dimensions, if we were to pull this down into three dimensions. So all of these nice animations are done by Daniel Pomerad in uh, France, who's been doing very beautiful work in, in the reconstructions. So there's uh, the real world. You can see uh, this gap down the middle here. That, which you'll see repeatedly, is just a, a, an area that's lost because of the plane of our own galaxy obscuring things, and we miss some information there. But otherwise, what you see here is the positions of galaxies nearby. Each of these little dots then is a galaxy, just like our own, and we're going in here to see where our galaxy is. So at the center of the bullseye, there's the Milky Way. And nearby are other galaxies that we know about, like Andromeda Galaxy, Messier 31, 
There's the Milky Way at the center. Andromeda. And here's all our neighbors. And we know where they are very well now. And uh, some of the bigger ones are being identified there. Now, as it happens, most of these nearby galaxies actually live in a rather thin plane. In fact, we're calling it the local sheet. So you can see as we tilt over here that most of the galaxies are actually in a little thin plane. And up above us, there's a really empty area that we are calling the local void. You can look a little farther away, that big uh, bunch of galaxies up here, that's the Virgo cluster. So that's the nearest big concentration of galaxies in our proximity. So we live in the Milky Way. Milky Way is a flattened galaxy. Here, you can look up in the sky um, and see the Milky Way, and you're in the Southern Hemisphere. At this time of year, you can see the galactic center uh, quite prominently if you're in a dark place. But this is just to remind you that we live in a big pinwheel galaxy rotating, and we're just one of 100 billion stars. Uh, our sun is one of 100 billion stars. There goes the Magellanic clouds uh, in this simulation then of the real universe, not of a pretend universe. And over yonder two million light years away is Andromeda Galaxy and its companion Messier 33. So this is the real universe uh, in an animation. But what we're going to talk about today is uh, measuring the peculiar velocities of galaxies. So on this particular map that I'm showing you, this is our latest uh, edition of, of the Cosmic Flows database with 18,000 galaxies. You can see that it's the, the domain of it is about 10% of the radius of the visible universe. Each one of these little dots is a galaxy. Uh, the colors indicate whether it's got a uh, anomalous peculiar velocity towards us or away from us. You can see the usual gap that is caused by the missing information in the uh, behind the zone of obscuration of our Milky Way galaxy. Now, rather well, well known in the field are these redshift surveys, what I'm showing you here. So we are located in the Milky Way down at the apex of this uh, these wedges. And what we're seeing here is information that's been gathered by people going to the telescope and getting spectra of galaxies. And with those spectra, they then get redshifts. They, they, they get an indication of uh, how far away galaxies are uh, just by the um, expansion of the universe. So they can position each one of the galaxies uh, in, a, in this wedge, across, in a, depending on our angle at the, across the sky and uh, redshift uh, as distance from us. And this lower wedge was from a survey done in the mid-1980s. Uh, and, and there was a discovery then of something that came to be called the Great Wall. And you can see then there's also empty areas. So this is the universe in filaments and and clusters and, and, and voids, uh, the coma clusters, this uh, particular feature in the middle of that plot. And then a couple of decades later, a larger survey done by the, with the Sloan uh, Consortium found an even greater structure that became known as the Sloan Great Wall. Well, okay, these are structures we're seeing in redshift surveys with no information about uh, uh, distances other than the information you get from the spectra and the redshift and the assumption that these are approximately at the location uh, that, uh, of their Hubble uh, expansion distance. But we want to do look at this structure in a different way. So what I was just showing you is uh, what is indicated by point one, uh, redshift surveys. You can observe the distribution of galaxies roughly from their redshifts. And then assuming that these galaxies have mass, 
you might be able to predict uh, the velocity fields that will be in response to that matter. But we're going to do, we're going to invert the, uh, the process here. We're going to observe the peculiar velocities of galaxies, the galaxy, the, the velocities that deviate from Hubble expansion. And we're going to predict what densities or what matter density distributions were required to give those peculiar velocities. So we're going to need distances. So this is the nature of our program. We measure distances. We can also measure the observed velocities of these galaxies, uh, which is basically, in large measure, they're due to the expansion of the universe. But with the distances, we can anticipate what uh, component of that velocity is just due to the expansion of the universe. We can subtract that off the observed and we're left with something called the peculiar velocity. This is the anomalous velocity that's arising because of the matter distribution in the universe. And there's a simple relationship then between these anomalous velocities and the density field. And it's given by this little formula here, where the, the density distribution depends on the gradient of the peculiar velocity field as given here. And then these factors over here are just constants that we don't that we can just plug in. So there's this direct relationship. When we get peculiar velocity, we're inferring information about the density field. So how do we get distances? Well, we use a whole bunch of different techniques, and we've done this over a, a series of of, uh, of publications. The first cosmic flow. Well, there was a cosmic flows one uh, in 2008. Uh, 2013, we had Cosmic Flows 2 with 8,000 uh, galaxy distances. Cosmic Flows 3 has 18,000 distances. And that's what we'll mainly be talking about now. Cosmic Flows 4 is in preparation and, and should be available about the end of this year. Anyways, we can measure distances with a whole bunch of different techniques. You see some in red and some in black here. The ones in red are ones that our little team has worked on, and the ones in black uh, come from the literature. And so, in the end, we, we make a big uh, potpourri of uh, all of these different methodologies. Uh, I'm just, I, I'll just tell you a little bit about these two in red that we've been working on, but you are appreciating that there is all this other information too that other people have done and contributed. So, Here's the ensemble of our sample here. This is just the number of galaxies that we have uh, in bins of velocity here. So we're going out here to 5% of the radius of the universe here uh, at this end, and that's where our information just falls right off. Uh, but you can see then that we have all these different techniques, the different colors are different methodologies. And I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about this uh, typical red giant branch and, and this other uh, information, uh, another methodology here that I was involved with. So let's talk about the tip of the red giant branch and how that works. This picture here is a picture uh, obtained, uh, an image obtained with Hubble Space Telescope. And if you look really hard, you can see that it actually it breaks up into little stars here. We're actually resolving it into stars. So let's imagine that there's a star right there. I can plot it on what is called a color magnitude diagram, which I'm showing over on the right here. A color magnitude diagram is a, a diagram where every little dot here is representing a star from, from this, this image of this galaxy. Faint stars are down below, bright stars are at the top. Hot blue stars are at the left, cool red stars are over at the right. So let's imagine that this uh, particular star is, has the color and the magnitude that would put it right here. And then every other star that you could find would lie someplace else. Well, here's several color magnitude diagrams here. Let's look at this one over here on the left. It's a particular galaxy, Holmberg one. Here you can see these, so each dot is, represents a, a star in that galaxy. And you can see the most prominent thing in this, uh, the most prominent feature is this 
so-called red giant branch. And we can go up to the tip of it here. The tip of the red giant branch has a very characteristic luminosity, uh, which will be very useful then for getting distances. Now, stars that lie over here, for example, these are young, hot stars that are still use, burning hydrogen in their cores. And up here, we see a bunch of stars that are uh, that are very hot supergiants that uh, are burning helium in their cores and will soon blow up as supernova. Over here, we see uh, stars that are sort of middle age, uh, called asymptotic giant branch stars that are on their way to becoming white dwarfs. But we're interested in, in this really dominant feature here, which is which are basically old stars that are um, have an inert uh, cores of, of uh, hydrogen of helium and uh, are burning hydrogen in their in outer shells. Now these are all really quite bright stars. If I was to plot the, the sun uh, see a star like the sun on this diagram, it would lie way down here at the bottom. So the so you can see here, we're really just talking about the, the biggest, brightest stars in, in this particular galaxy. But here's the, the tip of the red giant branch. Here's two other galaxies over here. For example, this galaxy over here doesn't have any of those young stars. It only has old stars, but it still has this red giant branch going up to a tip. And here's another galaxy down here. It has young stars, but again, we can see the, discern the tip here. And you can see here that these scales here, this one, the tip is at 24th magnitude. Here it's at 25.3, 25.3. Here it's at 25.6 almost. So you can tell that this is farther, this is more distant. Than, you know, this is the closest one. Oh, four megaparsecs. This one is 7.3 megaparsecs. This one uh, at 8.2 megaparsecs. So we can do that, and we've done that for more than 500 galaxies now, which is to say we're getting quite complete. We, we actually now know the distances to most galaxies uh, in our neighborhood. Well, this other methodology, just to, to, to show you this, this is a relationship between um, how fast galaxies rotate, which is given along this axis here, the log of the line width of, of how broad the uh, um, a, a 21 centimeter H1 profile is, which is indicative of how the, the broadening is due to the rotation of the galaxy. So fast rotating galaxies are on the right, slow rotating galaxies are on the left. And bright galaxies uh, are up and faint galaxies are down. So you can see this, if you looked at a bunch of galaxies all at the same distance, say in a cluster, you would set, then see that this nice relationship where the, the big galaxies rotate fast and the little galaxies rotate slow. This is all at a, in apparent magnitudes. We don't know necessarily how, um, how far away these galaxies are, but we just know that, uh, that there is this relationship in the, these properties. But over here, uh, we have an absolute calibration because all of these galaxies, uh, again, rotating here, big galaxies, little galaxies at the bottom. Uh, in these cases, we have very accurate distance, so either from the tip of the red giant branch that I just talked about, or from a methodology involving Cepheid uh, pulsating variables. So we know the absolute distances of these galaxies, which gives us the calibration. So then we can go into the field and we can get the distance of any other galaxy by looking at its apparent magnitude. And, uh, and with the knowledge of the absolute magnitude of that galaxy at a given line width. So if it was the, the line width was uh, in the log was 2.5, then we would know, uh, we would project up and we could get a distance. Okay, so those are two methods. And as I say, there's others. Oh, this is just showing you uh, the sort of information we get to measure those things. So we get line widths by looking at eight neutral hydrogen uh, profiles taken with uh, big radio telescopes. And we get uh, do photometry, either in the optical or the infrared, either from the ground or from space to get photometry of the galaxies. Okay, 
I said that we now have really good information nearby. And here's again a, a plot of, of the nearby neighborhood here with the Milky Way at the center of this, uh, this plot and Andromeda Galaxy and these other galaxies that are familiar to us uh, nearby. And we have very accurate distances. So if we actually look at these peculiar velocities I'm talking about for, for these galaxies, what do we find? We find that there, there's a lot of galaxies in a plane and they have a mix of, of motions toward and away from us. But in supergalactic coordinates then, all the galaxies that are underneath us, underneath that sheet. So above it, there's this big void area I talked about. But below it, there are galaxies, and every one of them is coming towards us in peculiar velocity, every one of them. So what's going on here? We not, and Oh, by the way, over here is a Virgo cluster. So now we know quite accurately uh, basically what is happening here. Here we are located at the zero, zero in these coordinates. The Virgo cluster is 16 uh, megaparsecs away, 50 million light years. And we have a motion of attraction towards Virgo because of its mass and away from this big local void. So we have a flow down here. So these, all these uh, galaxies below us in this coordinate system that appear to be coming toward us. In fact, they're not coming towards us in particular. We're moving towards them. And so it, all the, the, their motion is really just a, a reflex of our motion towards them because of uh, this, 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 this repulsion from the local void, the expansion of the local void. And here is just a, a picture of uh, flow patterns uh, nearby. Here's a little movie then of what's going on nearby. That big red ball, that's the Virgo cluster, and the two black uh, lines there, the two black vectors, are our own galaxy and Andromeda galaxy. As we flow downward out of the local void and over towards the Virgo cluster. I'll show it to you again. See how things are coming down out of the local void and across over to the Virgo cluster. And there's also a flow from towards the upper left corner uh, towards uh, some place that's called the Great Attractor, and that'll be a story a little later. But you see how uh, Andromeda and, and, uh, and our own galaxy are, are merging and I'll show you another movie then that's, that is uh, of the nearer air area to us. So the big gray ball over there is the Virgo cluster. And here's, in white, are the Milky Way and Andromeda. And there's a lot of other galaxies nearby, companion galaxies in the local group. And the intent of this movie is just show, to show how a, a plane of galaxies nearby might have formed. But those two white vectors are our old galaxy and Andromeda, which in fact will come together and merge in about uh, five billion years, if you're around to witness it. And so if you go to a larger scale, uh, that scale I was just showing you is just this region right in here. Virgo is up here, and here this is us. Here's this, here are these flow patterns here, and it's this flow, this general area of flows here that we uh, called Ladia Kea, uh, the supercluster that we live in. So there's these other superclusters nearby. Here's Perseus Pisces, here's Coma, up uh, here is Shapley. And so the, each of these uh, are their own entities. But, uh, but uh, we then gave a name then to this general area around us, uh, the Ladia Kea, supercluster with about uh, uh, 100,000 uh, big galaxies just like our own. And here we are over near the edge of it. Virgo's near the edge of it. And there's uh, a concentration of uh, major uh, clusters in, uh, in the center, the downtown area of uh, Nadia Cave. So one of the 
big questions that's been uh, before astronomers for quite a while is the origin of what is seen as a dipole in a microwave background. So down in the left corner here, I've got um, an image of the whole sky taken at uh, about one millimeter. And it was seen that to a first approximation, uh, there's the sky is uniform in the flux that's coming at one millimeter uh, from radiation from the time when the universe uh, transitioned from being a, a, a hot fireball to the cold universe. And, and uh, at that, it, it's rather like looking at the, the photosurface of the sun. To look back in time, if you look back far enough uh, in time, you'd be going into a plasma, which would be like going into the plasma of the sun. But at a certain surface, uh, the, the universe had cooled at a certain time uh, the universe had cooled down enough that electrons attached themselves to nucleons and the universe entered a stage of, of the cold universe, a cold, dark universe with uh, now gas that was cooling and uh, since it was being, became cool enough, it could start forming into structure. But when we look back at that surface, um, we see that there's a region of the sky it's a little bit hotter, a little bit, another region which is a little bit cooler. And the inference there is that with respect to the, the cosmic uh, rest frame, we're moving somewhere. And so that this, these temperature variations are due to uh, a Doppler shifting uh, due to our motion. And that motion is 630 kilometers per second. And it's in a certain direction and it's given by this yellow area, arrow here. And so what's causing it? That's the, that's the issue. What is causing this motion, a rather snappy motion of 630 kilometers per second of our local group? Well, when we look in that direction, first of all, it's in the direction of uh, the, the uh, downtown area of Laniakea. It's also, uh, there's something called the Shapley concentration back there that uh, was seen in one of my earlier slides. There's a big empty area in behind that we've called the dipole repeller. So these are all factors, um, but in fact, this motion is caused by the ensemble of the distribution of matter in the universe in our vicinity. And if we look in detail uh, at the structures, we see that there are these, these uh, we parse out the expansion of the universe. We parse out the large scale flows and that went away pretty fast. Uh, we find then that uh, there are these local flow patterns that, that, I, that I just saw, saw, saw there. Oop, let me go that. Okay, where did it go? Okay, you see these little flow patterns towards the knots, the high density knots. And uh, so we're starting to see these flow patterns. Okay, that takes us to. All that really came from uh, information that we gathered with Cosmic Flows 2. Uh, with Cosmic Flows 3, then, we've got a lot more information. What I'm showing you in this particular slide is each of these little vectors here, it's either red or blue, and the red ones are peculiar velocities where cases where peculiar velocities are moving away from us, and the blue ones are peculiar velocities moving towards us. And from that, we infer then uh, the distribution of matter locally. And here's a little movie then that shows a reconstruction drawn from the uh, observations of cosmic flow three. So appreciate that each of these structures is made up of, of tens and hundreds of thousands of tens of thousands of galaxies. What I'm now showing in these colors are the voids. These are the empty areas uh, they do have some galaxies, but basically these, these the blue, uh, yellow, black regions that I'm showing you here are quite devoid of galaxies. And this, we did this uh, in connection with a, a study of what we're calling the local void, that black area there. And so here, if we come in a little bit close, we can just see the focus on the local void that black area. And 
This is uh, Perseus Pisces. Over here is the, this is uh, the, the great attractor region. Um, Pavo Indus back here. Fornax cluster is here. So this is this is our, our local area. Well, what I'm going to show you now is, is something we've just been doing. It's uh, uh, kind of neat. Uh, it's something we're calling the South Pole Wall. The zone of obscuration is running along in a belt here that you're seeing here. Shapley that we just talked about is here. Here's the direction towards the uh, that we're moving with respect to the microwave background delta dipole at this 630 kilometers per second. So the focus of this particular study was on something we're calling the South Pole Wall because it's most intense right at the celestial South Pole. And here's a map then that shows its distribution across the sky, uh, length to length, and. Here, we're showing it in comparison then with these other structures that I showed you earlier. And you can see that in fact, it's about the same dimension as the Sloan Wall, but it's twice as close. It's about twice as far as the Great Wall, but twice as close as the Sloan Wall, and it's about as big as the Sloan Wall. So this is, so it's actually about a tenth the velocity of light across it which is quite amazing given that the, the, uh, the volume that we were studying is only of that dimension. So you couldn't have fit anything larger in the, in the volume that we're studying. And we really can't say that we see the whole size of, of the South Pole wall. And here's just a, a, uh, an animation of the velocity structure uh, within, so, so actually, in the lifetime of the universe, of uh, the universe, uh, uh, we don't move very far. Only a few megaparsecs, but we can trace the flow patterns. It's like looking at a, I don't know, a, a large river, and if we're to think of the Amazon River, and ultimately it's going to get to the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. But if we're just to look at it for a day, and we put some little uh, cork in the, in the upstream of, at the top of the stream. It, it would move along a little ways. And if we put corks in other places, we'd see them flowing towards the Atlantic to a different place. So, so this is the, the accumulation of, of the flow pattern then that, uh, that you would get. And uh, all here then. This is then an, an animation of the flow patterns. And, and you will see three colors here. Um, the reds are flow patterns that we're involved in, Lania Kea, and, and, and flowing towards uh, the downtown area of, of uh, our region. Uh, the blues are flow patterns towards uh, Perseus Pisces that I was talking about before. And the blacks are flow patterns that are going towards the Shapley concentration and includes the, Sloan, uh, the, the South Pole wall. I've been describing. And as we come around here, here's this uh, region in here is the Shapley area. And here's these flow patterns and then you're coming down off of the uh, South Pole wall, which is in fact in, in this area here. Well, that's actually uh, what I wanted to tell you today. And so I would, uh, in fact, uh, Thank you for, for inviting me, and uh, it's been a, a pleasure. Thank you very much, Brent. That was wonderful. We have uh, many questions in the Q&A, and, &A, and uh, we have certainly questions in the panel. And so before we go into the panel questions, I want to pick out just one question from the Q&A window, which is, uh, from Douglas Ward, uh, who asks you to explain the origin of the name Lania Kea. <laughs> Lania Kea. Hello. <laughs> he was a student of yours, apparently. Yeah. Well, I, we, we had this discovery of, of, of uh, 
Madia Kev, for which we got that name. But uh, I went to a Hawaiian uh, practitioner, uh, cultural practitioner, and asked him for a name. And the interesting background story then is he, he came up with a, a name. And if you know anything about Hawaiian language, some of these names are really very long and involved. He came back with such a name. And I said, no, 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 this has to be a name that people around the world can pronounce. And uh, it just wouldn't do to have this big long name. And so he, he went back and he came up with Lania Kea, which I appreciated. But the, the curious little part of the story is that this big long name, he, he afterwards he said, you know that long, that name, the first name, it had your name embedded in it. And so. <laughs> Anyway, not your camp. It's a good thing, I think. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so now we're gonna switch over to the panel questions, and I see here Ezekiel has a hand raised. Ezekiel, go ahead. Uh, yes, hi. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Yeah, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, I was wondering, uh, we are finding larger and larger structures, and you found the, the South Pole one. Uh, yeah. At what point do you think we run into troubles with the cosmological principle? <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, that's the, the biggest question. Because as I said, we, we're finding structures that are as big as the volume that we can survey, that we have surveyed. So we really have no handle on how big they can be. On the other hand, and and at this level, if, if it stopped there, uh, you'd say, okay, okay, these are pretty big, but they're not impossible within the standard cosmology. But if you could go out, uh, another, you know, what we want to do with supernova is go on a factor of two, which is an increase in volume of a factor of 10, roughly. Uh, if we're still seeing things at that level, that would be amazing. But Okay, so that's all I can say right now is it's it's they're getting really big and really interesting, but uh, we couldn't say that they're not consistent with the uh, standard cosmology. Yeah. Okay, then we continue with I believe it was Brian who had his hand first up. Hello. Yes. Thanks. I really enjoyed the flow diagrams. Uh, my, my question is actually similar to the last one. Um, the, have you compared the flow patterns to cosmological simulations like we heard in a talk a couple of weeks ago? And are the structures and velocities comparable to what we see in those? Okay, I'm not sure what you saw a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> um, I think the answer is the same. I mean, <clears throat> We can compare to simulations. That's what, you know, that's the only thing that goes bigger. And 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 and, and indeed, what we're finding that is that on the scales of uh, 200 megaparsecs, we're finding flows that are kind of one to two sigma above what you'd expect with lambda CDM, a standard lambda CDM, which is to say, high but not implausibly high. Okay. Thank you. We continue with John. Excuse me. Uh, hi, Brian. Um, hi. Hi, John. Hey, how are you? So you said that Cosmic Flows 3 has 18,000 galaxies and Cosmic Flows 4 will have 30,000. Um, so with all these galaxies, I mean, why, I, when do you have enough and, and, and what are, what's the next step? Um, where to but, go from here? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's really critical to have high density. Um, you know, you and I have been talking about surface brightness fluctuations. This, the good thing about that is is the higher accuracy. The trouble with uh, line widths, my thing, and also the fundamental plane is 20 to 25 percent uncertainties in each one. Uh, it really be good to get down to 5 and 10 percent uncertainties. Each one of those is worth uh, an awful lot of the, the poorer ones. Also, with something like surface brightness fluctuations, we're nailing down these uh, where the flows are going to. Uh, it's a good complement to say that 
the spiral galaxies that I've been studying normally because they're flowing towards, well, where are they flowing? They're flowing towards the clusters. So that's, is that, that, that's an aspect. And the other thing that we'll want more and more in the future is supernova distances because we grow out a factor of two of distance uh, out, out to uh, a tenth of the velocity of light rather than 5% of the velocity of light. And uh, if we get thousands of supernova, that would be delightful. Can I ask one follow up related to that then? Um, Brent, do you see, you know, with LSST, Rubin Observatory coming online, everybody in Chile is certainly excited about it and all over the world. Do you see applications for the cosmic flows from the Rubin Observatory, LSST? I have to be, I have to say not particularly. Uh, the, the issues, uh, you know, because as I said, I think the next step is, is supernova, but these are bright supernova by comparison. <laughs> And so right now, for example, we're driving our, we're, we've got a supernova program with Atlas. And also there's Assassin. Assassin doesn't go up quite as far, but Atlas will get us to about a tenth velocity of light. Uh, it has higher cadence than we'll get with, uh, with uh, the Rubin telescope. And uh, you don't need to go to 23rd or 24th magnitude. You only, only need to go to 20th magnitude to pick up these things. So that's my answer there, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have quite a few questions from, uh, from the audience. So I'm gonna pick out a few here. So Ernesto Camacho has asked, why is there a local sheet at all? Do we know how and why uh, there is this particular geometry? Yes, uh, so it's actually not a surprise in the end to, to know that there's a, a void next to us because wherever you have structure you have voids adjacent in fact if you looked at uh, any of the simulations you would know that if you lo located yourself on a filament well surely enough there's a, a, a void next door and so that's the answer is that the, this material voids are expanding and uh, the walls of the voids are these sheets that were and we're we're part of a sheet that's the neighbor of the wall. Um, so another question uh, from Nicola, Nicholas Metza. What are the, the biggest biases in your distances and can they be improved? Oh, uh, well, biases. I'm struggling with that every day right now as we try and come up with uh, Cosmic Flows 4. And, and it really is sobering to see the possibilities of biases. One of the best ways, and this is why it's really good to have all these different techniques, is it, as you intercompare uh, surface brightness fluctuations and supernova and fundamental plane, and, and, and you put them all into a, a mix. You know, when you're talking about a cluster like the Virgo cluster, you know, the Virgo cluster has only got one distance. It's up to us to find it. But if we're looking at it with five different techniques, all of techniques should give the same distance. And if they don't, that's bias. <laughs> Yeah, I think biases are something we're all struggling with in astronomy <laughs> all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we've had quite a few questions from Hans Zinnecker. He's very persistently asking, uh, what about the new results of E. Rosita and the spatial distribution of cosmologically distant superclusters? What can we learn from these recent new observations? Oh, uh, well, what do you want to know the, about the new Lear bio? versus the old, I, uh, or the distant ones. I, I'm not sure if I fully understand what he wants to know. Uh, so he's asking about E. Rosita and the distribution of distant superclusters. Um, yeah. He's asked the question a few different ways, but I can't find anything that's clearer. Well, um, okay, sure. You know, so everything we're, I'm talking about is, is nearby, and we can look at it full sky and get a lot of details. Um, in the, yeah, we're learning more and more about the distance structure too and how early it was and it, it did start to form very early as simulations tell us it would. Um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's all going into the, it's all good stuff for, for learning about this, the development of structure in the universe. Of course, one of the issues that's come up is um, with the Hubble constant con uh, controversy and, and the, the growth of structure. 
So Lambda CDM makes a pr prediction on the growth of structure. And is that correct? Is it consistent with what we see at a great distance vis-a-vis -vis what we see nearby? Well, that means the investigator. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And one final question. There was a question in Spanish. Um, am I under so maybe Patricio can, I'll say it in Spanish, and maybe Patricio can translate on the English channel for you. ¿A qué se refiere con vacío espacio, uh, vacío local y ese movi movimiento es deseable? Am I supposed to get it someplace? Um, yes, I think we need to, Patricio needs to move to the English channel to translate. Yeah, I mean, uh, Patricio, um, Okay, Patricia. Um... Well, let me translate this quickly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, Patricia? Okay. Oh, what? Patricia oh, stays on the Spanish channel. Yeah. yeah so, so um, what do you mean by local void and, uh -huh. um, and its movement, like uh, with respect to the attraction towards, towards any over density locally? Yeah, so I'll talk about repulsion from voids. The local void is just the nearest of them. <laughs> there are voids all over the place, and the local void is actually surprisingly big. Uh, is it, we're moving away from it. We're, so is it the fact that uh, it's repulsing us, or is it the fact that we're being pulled towards stuff uh, that's on the other side of the local void? Obviously, it's the case we're being pulled towards where the matter is and if you have a big void there just is no matter there i kind of like to talk about it like uh, 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 uh tug of war uh is it the stronger team that wins or the weaker team that loses so a matter of person <laughs> do you want to take another one Let's take one more from the pan from the Q and A, and then we can go back to the panel because I know Alejandro has had his hand up for a while. So we have a question from Hernan Quintana. From the figures, it looks like uh, the voids are dynamically more relevant than mass concentrations, like Shapley. Is that correct? Well, they're both relevant, but but uh, voids are are relevant on very wide scales. So if you're near a Shapley then it's pulling towards you. But of course, there's all these different competing uh, centers of, of high density, which are competing for your interest. Whereas the voids can get very, very large. And so they, they create a, a, a patterns in the flow field that are on lo very large scales. Okay, let's go to Alejandro on the panel. Yeah. Hi, Brent. Nice to see you again after so many yeah. years. Uh, we know that the measurements that you do uh, for, for densities and velocity come from radiation produced by baryons, and that the baryons are like uh, the tip of the iceberg of dark matter. And up to what point uh, the dynamic that you measure in baryons is a true reflection of the dynamic of the dark matter, are they really in phase or they may be out of whack to say something? Okay, well, now we do all our modeling within the, within the context of standard lambda uh, CDM and the presumption is that to a, a reasonable approximation, the, uh, the baryons are lighthouses down at the center of the, of the potential wells of the uh, dark matter. <clears throat> Certainly we see, when we see these uh, these uh, attractors, they have to be 90% dark matter. It's certainly not the baryons that are attracting us. That just that wouldn't make it. So it is the dark matter. And obviously the, the, the lighthouses of the baryons are well coordinated, well aligned. Now what's an interesting thing though is uh, a study that I haven't even been talking about, what we're doing right now, which is really quite that it, it's it lies at the basis of that animation that I showed you the flow patterns uh, towards the Virgo cluster. I showed you little orbits, um, 
as we move towards the Virgo cluster. Now, it was done with numerical action, uh, where we look at each of these uh, galaxies or, or clusters as little uh, billiard balls that are uh, being pulled around with time. Uh, we can infer reasonably the masses of these billiard balls that are required to, to uh, do everything. But what's particularly interesting is that to match the known density of uh, the universe, we need about a factor of two more mass than we put in those billiard balls. And we talk about orphan particles. And I don't know how this relates to simulations. It's something that I haven't really understood in the context of simulations. But roughly half of our particles um, would not be in in the, in, in the collapsed structures. It's more uh, diffuse across space. So that's kind of an interesting little side issue. There's another very interesting detailed question from Antonieta Ortiz. And she's asking, how is the factor of time managed in your derivation of these structures? Do you consider do you ray trace back where the galaxy was initially coming from when it's at you know, x mega gigaparsec? Yeah, so those orbit uh, calculations I'm, I was just talking about, we do trace back to redshifts of four or so, the early universe, the first uh, just a, little, a couple of billion years, one and a half billion years. And, uh, but we are treating so what we're looking at them, these, these uh, entities like the Virgo cluster hadn't formed at that time. Um, but what we're doing is then tracing back the center of mass of all of the particles that ultimately end up in the Virgo cluster. Uh, yeah, so what can I say? Uh, <laughs> it's, so, yeah, yeah. You consider that. <laughs> and, oh, of course, the time depends on them. This, uh, the Hubble constant, for example. So our model and that sets the clock of uh, how old the universe is. And Anis Rodriguez Diaz has a question about: Are younger galaxies moving faster from each other than old galaxies? Uh, no. <laughs> First of all, all galaxies we know about pretty well have old components. That is the study. When we talk about young galaxies, usually what we were talking about is galaxies with young features in them. And in other cases, that the old galaxies just don't have any young features. But they all have 13 billion year old stars pretty well. So we have a question from Yara on the panel. Hi, Brent. Thank you for the very, very nice talk. I just have a simple question following up on uh, the nice simulation that you showed where the Milky Way and Andromeda were you know, clearly uh, visibly merging as they fell into the Virgo cluster. Yes. Um, if, you could, if you could just comment a little bit more how this uh, flow patterns in, in your simulations, if you can really map all the mergers that are about to happen and the time scales and the different environments where they will happen. Well, that's right. That, and that is a feature of our or, or orbit recalculate uh, calculations that I showed in those movies, the obvious thing you can do is just move them forward and see when things are going to bump into each other. Now, it has to be said, though, that uh, we can't take these orbits, individual orbits, too, too, too seriously. Uh, the collectivity of them we do take seriously, but the individual orbits are, are rather uncertain. And in particular, the case of uh, Andromeda and our own galaxy, there's still not enough information on the proper motion of of the of Andromeda to be certain whether it's going to be a, a direct head-on collision or a, a wide swinging by collision. <laughs> so, lots to be learned. Yeah. Okay. So Paul also had a question. Yes. So very nice flow diagrams. They're really really beautiful. So you've shown that the galaxies flow towards the Virgo cluster. And uh, my question would be, can you also comment uh, on the Fornax cluster? Do you see there any flows? Oh, yes. Oh. 
yes, it's much smaller. It's 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 a uh, uh, okay. So a Virgo cluster is about uh, uh, six, seven, ten to the fourteen solar masses, and, and, and four X is about one, ten to the fourteen, um, and the flows around them are, you know, so so Fornax has a small infall region, and uh, and it is interesting now to see these partitioning, uh, to see these flow patterns uh, around all of the major uh, structures. Yeah. Hey, uh, John has a question. Uh, yeah, sorry to ask again, but. Um, Brent, so you just referenced the Hubble constant, and I saw your diagrams. You're using 75. Um, last week there was a talk, one of the in the series by Jim Peebles about cosmology, and Adam was on the the panel, and there was a discussion about the discrepancy between H naught from the CMB and from local measures. And I was just wondering if you could give your perspective on what might be uh, underlying yeah. that. Yeah. Well. The first thing to say is that for peculiar velocities, uh, I don't need to know an exact Hubble constant. I just have to have consistency with my measurements. So, I'm on, other, on the other hand, I'm measuring distances to galaxies. I'm trying to have a proper basis for the, the, the zero pointing, the scaling. And we find uh, Hubble constant values around 75 and with an uncertainty of, of, a, of a couple of units. So 73 would be fine, 76 would just equally be fine, um, but 70 would be really, uh, I, I, we talked about before about uh, the systematics, and but I can't really see it going as low as 70, and certainly not as low as 67. So uh, I think that is a real issue that uh, has to be, you know, there's, there's some fun in physics to be sorted out. <laughs> There are, um, yeah, there are two um, like highly upvoted questions, somewhat related uh, in the Q and A. So, how do you get the three D velocity and the flows reconstructed from radial velocities purely? And so, basically, how do you create this? cosmic flow patterns and how in the end will the expansion of the universe affect its coherence? So those are from Regis Lachaume and Raj S. Yeah. Well, what can I say? First, you know, uh, certainly a large, uh, certainly the Hubble expansion is dominant. Uh, very nearby, peculiar velocities, these deviations from Hubble expansion actually are very significant, but you don't have to get very far uh, before the expansion of the universe is dominant. And that's uh, described by the Hubble constant. And so what we're, we're picking around in the noise here to get uh, these peculiar velocities out of that. Uh, what's helping us tremendously though is the coherence. And you saw these uh, coherence in the, in the all adjacent um, galaxies in a, in a long filament are moving together. They might be moving at several hundred kilometers per second, but they, but, but, but the difference between them is only a few tens of kilometers per second. And so it's that coherence and the ability to measure many galaxies that allows us to, to build up the patterns. And, and the, the technique, how you, you know, how you get from radio velocities to basically the, the three uh, at the floor. Yeah. So, so, uh, it's kind of like a moving uh, clusters thing. You know, if you look at um, a bunch of stars in the sky and you know they're going in the same direction, but you, you get some angu uh, angular information uh, across them. Uh, so you can see the, the, the direction, the, the apex of where they're going, um, just because we've got a different angle on each one. And so, if, yes, we only get a, a radial uh, component, but because we're seeing uh, constituents in the same flow from with different orientations uh, that allows us essentially to triangulate in on where they're going. Okay. 
Okay, so we have a new, a newly upvoted question in Spanish, but someone's given me the translation. How does our little knowledge of dark matter affect the measurement of the speeds of galaxies? So this was from Ariel Sand Sandoval. Uh, well, the speeds are, they're being caused by gravitational pull. So we measure a peculiar velocity, a, a, a motion of, of a galaxy, and we infer that it got that from uh, a gravitational pull. And that gravitational pull implies a mass. So really, basically, that's it. You have a mass, it's pulling on us, and it's creating a velocity. And that velocity, then, then we invert the process, going from peculiar velocity to inferred mass. And if there's no more questions from the panel, there's one more I wanted to ask from the Q&A from Jamika Marshall. Do we know more about what the great attractor actually is and why it seems to have so much mass that it can so dras uh, drastically affect the movement of galaxies? Yes, so it's not a specific place. Uh, it's an accumulated place. So the great attractor in particular, the downtown area of Mani Akea supercluster, there's actually about eight uh, really serious clusters over there, including the Virgo cluster, the nearest one, uh, Centaurus cluster, Norma cluster, Hydra, and a whole bunch of other ones that have got a bell names. Um, so it's the accumulation of them. There's not a, it's like a, a downtown area of a city. You know, where is the center of a city? Well, it's not exactly well defined, but uh, the, there's a plate, there's a high density area. So that's what the great attractor is. It's just the uh, an area where there's a lot of matter has been accumulated. Okay, is there any more questions from the panel? Uh, so Yara has just messaged me to say she has a question. No, she's shaking oh. her head. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's someone in the attendee in the audience, Matthias Montesinos. Uh, Matthias, I'm going to unmute you. Could you please ask your question if you have one? Not the case. So I'm going to ask another question from Hernan Quintana. Do the attractions to Virgo Shapley and the repulsion from the repeller are completely consistent with the motion of the Milky Way? There is no missing attractor? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, is there no missing attractor? No, I, well, we keep finding more. Like we're now talking about the South Pole Wall. The South Pole Wall has an effect on us of about uh, 50 kilometers per second. So again, the, the center of it. So in the end, the, it's the yes, accumulation of so many places. I think though that between the dominant actors on our motion, Shapley, uh, the great attractor, Virgo, the local void, which is pushing us, and then this uh, this uh, dipole repeller that's in the op opposite direction. I think those put those together, and you're, you've got most of what is causing our motion. Unless there's a big surprise at a farther distance that we haven't even discovered. <laughs> okay, here are two other related questions from the audience um, from Leonardo Castaneda and Jacqueline Seron. Um, do you think we can use these peculiar flows at some point, at certain distance, of course, to detect deviations from GR? And, and can you turn the fields or the flows around to actually get, get yeah. a feeling for you know local differences in the in the Hubble metric constant? I mean, that would be, of course, the inverse case. Yeah. Well, what people are hoping to do is is to test this this growth factor. Uh, parameter. And so if they, if you see the growth, the, the development of structure from a high redshift to, to now, you know, that right now there's a, a, a standard growth pattern, uh, 
growth factor that's related to GR, um, omega the 0.55. So, <clears throat> you know, if that growth, if, if the evidence from, um, uh, you know, that is, that that's wrong, you could have something for GR. Somewhat uh, tangential question. Um, what language, I guess programming language, do you and your collaborators use to make those great simulations? <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, um, Danielle's working in IDL, and he's, he's, uh, he's written code himself. Is, I don't know, he's got how many, 20,000 lines or something in his code <laughs> that he's written himself. Okay, so maybe the final question. Uh, so the previous question was from Marco Alfonso Alvan, and now the last question from Suwaba Basu. Is there any way to explain the local white with the help of dark energy predominantly? Yeah, well, you know, it, we, our current view of a dark energy is that it's everywhere and uniform. And if it is, then uh, you wouldn't, expect it to really be a, a factor, uh, except in the clock, in the timing of, of how things develop. There are plausible, you know, people have suggested that uh, dark energy could be uh, spatially variable. Okay, then uh, that could be a factor. Yeah. All right, I think we're gonna wrap up here, unless there are any other questions from the panel. It's not the case, then thank you all very much again. Thank you, Brent, for a wonderful talk and a great discussion afterwards. Um, all the talks of the series will be added, of course, to the Astrophysica, we say, YouTube channel in high quality. So don't worry if there were problems with the audio or you were dropping the video signal. This will be fixed in the, in the YouTube version. So the videos of uh, Jim Peebles and Volker Springer and Sandy Faber are already in their original English on our YouTube channel, so please check them out. The Spanish translations of Sandy and Volker are ready. We're just cross-checking them. They will be put um, into the public domain as well very soon. And so there is nothing left to say except to thank everyone again. Thank you, Brent, for a wonderful talk. And thanks for the panel members. Thanks to the audience. And we will see you hopefully in the next webinar of gold. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Bye bye.